observation stuff. So you look at the 50s, 60s, 40s, that's when you had moth floor rose, that's when you had autumn olive, that's when you had honeysuckle. So they were actually introduced here. Correct. Mm. Correct. Correct. Um, I don't know the whole process, like of the garlic mustard, how that was introduced, or but it was brought in. They obviously, someone was experimenting with it. It kind of got away. Got out of hand. With the other ones, though, they were, you know, they were planning, not thinking that they were going to become over aggressive uh, and spread the way they've spread. Now, right behind you, is that with the white um, berries? That's native dogwood. That's native dogwood. Yeah, native dogwood. So okay. that that's, was here, has been here, um, compared to the honeysuckle, which was introduced underneath. This is autumn. Autumn olive? Okay. Yeah. People, it, I, I, I'm actually filming a little bit. Uh, <laughs> people actually will uh, uh, call it autumn olive and you wonder what it is, but it's actually autumn <laughs> olive. Right, right. And, and then there, yeah. That's there, and then this is uh, honeysuckle. Right. All through there, that's all honeysuckle. Mm. How do you get rid of this stuff? Um, when it's small like this, it can be pulled. Okay. When it gets bigger, and what I mean by bigger, if you look, like this is a bigger honeysuckle here. Right. Right here. And then see that plant there, it's kind of multi-stemmed over there. Mm -hmm. That's a bigger honeysuckle too, and there's quite a few of those. Yep. And you can just see how they canopy, and there's not really the only thing that's growing underneath the honeysuckle is honeysuckle. Mm. There's nothing this else. This is all honeysuckle. Yeah. Okay. But you know how I told you sometimes there's stuff here. I look at this, and some of this stuff here. Just a minute here. That's a grass. Yeah, I think it's actually a sedge. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a some type of native sedge. So there's nice. there's some native stuff in here that you know, but I mean this is not something that would be solved overnight. I mean this would take a long time. So this would I mean, not this, be a good you, candidate for you, burning. Well, yeah, because you just don't you you're not going to have the fuel load to run a fire through here. Mm. If this was all bigger oak and we had all this honeysuckle, fire might be a tool that we could use. But in this case, it's going to be pretty, pretty hard. Is a non-native invasive? Correct. Okay, thank you. One's a black cherry, which yep. is okay as well. Yep. And then hackberry is good too. Yep. Very good. It's right here. Oh, 90 plus. Really? Yeah. They're not super fast growing. You know, and a great way to evaluate this to see how much honeysuckle you have is wait for the first couple frost, come back in here, and if it's all green, it's pretty much all honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. Everything else will kind of brown. This will keep its leaves on for a couple weeks after the first frost. Now, now the whole um, garlic mustard thing, that's relatively new. I mean, 20 years ago, I don't remember seeing so much. Correct. Correct. Where did it come from? Um, it was introduced, I think, from Europe for medicinal and other purposes, and um, it kind of exploded. And this was used for habitat, conservation, for windbreaks and everything, and now it's completely taken over our woods and stuff. Mm. So was autumn olive. Mouth floor rose was used for fence, um, fence row. Clear weed. It's kind of a, a pioneer in the sense that if you have disturbance and different things like that, um, it, and here the disturbance is you got a lot of non-natives that pretty much are killing everything else, so mm. it's been able to kind of get established. Native sedges. So there are some huh. native things in here, but there's a lot of, um, just a lot of honeysuckle and stuff in here. Just Like, oh, um... I don't know the common name, but a lot of people call it beggar's lice or uh, touch or uh, stick knots. But they stick on you at the yeah. Little yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the deer right now, they're just covered with it. Right. And so are people like me. <laughs> um, I get them on my clothes and 
And somebody plant some apples in here because here's an apple and I noticed there was an apple oh, yeah, yeah. in the middle too. I, yeah, yeah. In fact, there's another apple here. There's one on my side of the line. And then we had a, um, a volunteer apple that's come up that's just beautiful. And we've got another one in the backyard with which the um, the deer feed off of. So there, there's a lot of apple around here actually. Okay. And do you think this variety of apple is okay to have? I don't know what variety it is, but it's, I mean, apple is not going to hurt anything. Good. Yeah. Good. I mean, it's good for the deer. And, oh, they love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have like a petting zoo in my backyard. <laughs> this is all pretty much honeysuckle, isn't it? I mean, this is just dog hair thicket. Hmm. And, and cherry's okay. But it's not very diverse. So like on this knob, it's pretty much uh, black cherry. Huh. I mean, the, the way the branches are shriveled up and stuff, I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. I mean, 99% of them, when they die, they get from Dutch elm disease on the elms. So, I mean, that's their... And then it's covered with Virginia creeper after yeah, that. Yeah, that's yeah. from the red oak to the white oak. Okay. But one thing we tell people about oaks is to never prune oaks during the growing season because there's a beetle that carries that fungus also. So if you have open wounds in the summertime, you can actually attract the beetle, which could actually bring the fungus too. Oh, that's interesting. So if you're ever going to prune an oak tree, you always want to prune it in the wintertime. And what's not needed? Uh, because I see a whole lot on the, uh, the east side of the uh, uh, there, and, and it seems like the, the bees certainly like it. Right. Mm -hmm. And certain thistle fence like the gold fence. And uh, so, I mean, if they're native thistle, if they're non-native thistle that are on the noxious weed list, then I mm -hmm. guess you need to respect the noxious weed list. Okay. But, but their red berries will be in pairs. Ah. Uh, honeysuckle, red berries in pairs. Yep. Whereas the my life, I think would be more single type berries. Okay, single type berries. The other thing is um, the autumn olive, their leaves alternate from side to side. So you got one over here, one over there, and they alternate as they go up and down the twig. See oh, that, how they alternate? Yep. Honeysuckle, on the other hand, is... Um, Honeysuckle is opposite. They're in pairs up and down the twig. So paired berries and paired leaves. Yeah. Okay. Paired berries, paired leaves. The challenge is there's some native stuff that are paired too, so that's not the only ID characteristic to it. But again, this is just loaded with honeysuckle. This whole whole area. Rid as many of the non-natives as possible, but I mean it's overwhelming. It it would have to be a long-term, hey, we're going to just keep chipping away at this. And and what I would do here is if as I if I created openings where I had openings that new trees could come, then I could incorporate some oak and some other native species that would normally. But I think that's going to be in the future. In the future um, with all the, I mean, you're going to battle the non-native stuff for a long time. And, and again, really looking over on that side, it, it was basically dirt besides the honeysuckle. So you can see from a water quality standpoint and stuff that if some native plants had a chance to get going back in there with some of those sedges and stuff, you know, and that, that may be an area that as you start getting rid of that stuff, um, you kind of see if some of that stuff can come back on its own first. Cause that's what we did at Woodpecker Trail is, in that case, we just allowed more sunlight and once we allowed more sunlight, it was like a bed of grass in there at the sedges. I, I don't expect that here at all, but I think you could get some response. But that is, that's pretty nasty. That would be where you would start? Um, well, I, I mean, I think in any of these areas, I don't know if one's necessary a priority or the other. I mean, they're all, they all have significant invasives. I mean, basically everywhere we walked around the pond in the common ground, it was, I mean, your main one was honeysuckle, but in like up on the hill coming down and here's more autumn olive. Right. Um, 
I would probably go after the woodies first, and then if you can incorporate some work on the garlic mustard at times, I would too. Um, but definitely the anytime you find Oriental bittersweet, I would and those bigger vines, I would get after those first because those are probably some of those are getting the size where they're already producing seed or they're gonna produce seed pretty soon. So um, those would be some of kind of the priorities. And and I don't know what kind of budget you guys have, if you have any, but um, there are a few uh, firms for fees that could start to try to help you with stuff like that um, and try to help you come with strategies to where they can come in and pull and spot spray and cut and treat and different things like that. Um, there, I, I have done some of these plans for other associations and they have put some of those groups on retainer and they say, well, we've got a thousand dollars come in and do a thousand dollars worth of work this year. and come back next year and I think that we'd be able to do something like stuff that. like that you know where yeah. they slowly chip away and at the same time then they as their group they'll go in and have work days and they'll try to do stuff too but they use a group like that to kind of maybe make a bigger dent I but, understand. Um, right, did you mention that there was um, possibly some uh, grants available I think that was for planting oh for planting okay yeah. there may be some stuff through Kate's office for different stuff and some for some of these associations and stuff usually okay. when it's connected to water and stuff like that sometimes there's different grants or a okay. few different things but so for honeysuckle things like that it's if it's large you have you can just cut the tree you got to cut it um but if you don't treat it with a herbicide it'll sprout okay. back right um and i think you guys really didn't want to use chemical on yours and so yeah. i think we talked about on the small stuff, you can pull it, pull it. On the big stuff, you just got to keep cutting if you don't want to use herbs. Okay. I mean... But even like, I mean, I'm Mr. Organic. However, um, spotting like right on top of the, um, uh, like where you cut something, like right, right on there, that's not going to spread. It's just going to go deeper into the root, right? Yeah, and you're using a small dose. So, you know, on a... Because the thing is, like on a big autumn olive like that, you cut that off and the next year it sprouts would be this tall. So if you can keep cutting it, I mean, you can try to take some energy. I mean, in your place, it's right there. It might be easier for you to do. Here, it may be more troublesome, but if you got, usually if the plants are lower than knee high, a lot of times, sometimes those can be pulled. So a lot of that little stuff can be pulled, but that's hard, I mean, that's- It's a lot of work. That's groundwork, mm -hmm. and that is, Tough stuff. Tough stuff. And I've done it, and I've worked with volunteers doing it, and it, you'll think you'll pull, and you did a great job, and you'll look, and it'll look like you got as many plants as you, <laughs> you started. I mean, because there's just so much there. There is so much there. Cottonwood, uh, river birch, maybe sycamore, not as much. If you wanted an oak species, maybe a swamp oak or a pen oak, those kinds that are more adaptable to, especially if the lake level or if the pond level changes over time it and does. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so you're going to want more kind of water loving. And then as you get up on the hills, if you get openings, then you can do things like red oak, white oak, chinkapin oak, shagbark hickory, um, black walnut, black cherry, stuff like that. I mean, and I can incorporate some of that stuff in my plan. Because it's very long. I mean, the, the, the alternative is if you let it go, it's just going to be a big mess of non-native invasives at some point. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, a lot of stuff is just going to, what's there is going to get choked out. And it's probably not going to have a lot of understory vegetation. So its condition is going negative. I mean, it's going to get worse. So you can decide to just let it get worse and just let it keep going or you can decide are we going to slowly chip away to try to bring it back to some improvements mm. but there's not a lot of what i would typical oak hickory up in here there was a, a few little hickories and an oak or two but not based on the soils and stuff not what i expected mm. there's a lot more invasives and non-natives than i expected but so there's basically two things that we can do. One would be that we can plan on in these areas that are kind of open right now, 
that we could introduce some of the trees that you just talked about. And then in terms of getting further back around, really we're going to have to come up with a long-term plan right. to chip away it. And do you think that it's better to do sections at a time? I mean, it's obviously we're not going to have 10000 bucks a year, you know, to, to, to attack the whole thing, you know, for a five or ten year period. That, that right. kind of money doesn't exist here. But if we were to, um, you know, say, okay, we're going to put a thousand bucks a year into uh, clearing non-native uh, invasives, invasives yeah. would you recommend starting at one side or the other? Or what, what would your recommendation be? I would probably be? start on that side and work my way that way. Okay. And uh, because there are some native hickories and stuff in there and stuff, and then we saw some of the sedges and stuff that if you start to get rid of some of the non-native stuff, that hopefully you could bring back some of that okay. stuff. Um, and then if it got really open in there, then you could, you know, reevaluate after you took out the honeysuckle and autumn olive and all that stuff. You could evaluate to see if there's room to plant very well, plant more stuff. But I would probably have them start on an edge like that and just keep taking that money and just keep moving across over time and uh but at the same time i would try to get volunteer groups or others to try to i mean again just paying a thousand dollars a year to chip away at it is going to take forever and the thing is it will never be done mm. never you're never going to get to a point where you go oh we got it because there's always new ones coming so again you have to decide is it worth investing money to try to improve it and you get to a point where you can somewhat maintain some equilibrium i mean you're never gonna get rid of all the non-natives you just i mean i never say never but we we're talking hundreds or thousands well, of man cases, hours basically it's just, yeah it's just over the next five to ten years that um even if you I just can't imagine getting rid of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, so what you're really trying to do is try to reduce it as much as possible to try to bring back some of the native flora to, you know, give it a chance to get established. And then if you make good headway, you've got to realize that it doesn't stop at that point. That even if you get to a level where you really minimize it, then you have to get in the maintenance level where you have to maintain it at that level or continue to drop it. I mean, gotcha. if you ever stop it's just going to come back i understand so you do let's say you spent ten thousand dollars and you were you got rid of all the big stuff and you got all a bunch of that lower stuff over there the honeysuckle and you're going wow this looks really good and you walk away <laughs> come back in 10 years it could look the same as it does right now because this stuff is pretty quick. is there a better or worse time of the year to be doing this um pulling you can pull at any time I mean, obviously in the winter you can't because the ground's frozen most mm -hmm. of the time, so you're not going to get much pulling. For if you're cutting and treating, I really like fall. So basically from September through probably early October okay. is a good time to cut and treat because a lot of that material is starting to move down to the roots. The, mm -hmm. the chemical's going to move better to the roots and stuff. Good. All right. All right.